if we just check somebody's energy, we know whether they have had children or not. You go to a local astrologer, for twenty-five rupees, he will tell you how many children you have, whether they're surviving or not surviving, even what their names are. When you die, you want your child around you. They said son, because practically it was only possible for the son to be around, daughter would be somewhere else. You have a little space occupied by the quality of that being. But they don't have that little space occupied within by you, because that little space, if it becomes pleasant, that being will experience pleasantness. Till that being finds another body, till then you can influence. Once it finds another body, you have nothing to do with it. I don't know if I should say this because if I say this, you may start imagining all kinds of things. Wherever you focus your mind, there there will be some twitching. If you want, right now you experiment, hold your little finger like this and focus at the tip of this little finger, you will see within a minute's time there will be twitching. If I hold my hand above my Brahmarandra, even up to four feet above, if you hold it, you will see a clear feeling in your hand. If you have a newborn baby in your home, you would see a certain part of the skull is not formed. Have you noticed this? So the child has to be handled gently, that part is just skin, there is no bone. So, this part in the yogic terminology is referred to as Brahma Randra. Randra means a passage, like a small hole or a tunnel or a passage. So this is known as Brahma Randra. So this is the space in the body through which life descends into the fetus because life has descended into the fetus and life keeps its options open. Whether this body is capable of sustaining it or not, it keeps the options open. That much awareness is there in the life process, so it keeps that trap door open till the last minute. It wants to keep it open just in case it finds the body unsuitable for its existence, it will leave. And it does not want to leave from any other passage in the body, it wants to leave the way it came. A good guest always comes through the front door and goes out through the front door. If he comes through the front door and goes out to the back door, that means your house is swept clean. So, he wants to go out to the same door, so he keeps it open till the last minute he wants to keep his choices. There are any number of probably if there are doctors or obstetricians you would know, there are any number of cases where by all medical parameters the fetus is healthy, everything is fine, but uh, for some reason, a stillbirth happens simply because the life within is still choosing. If it finds a wrong kind of body is happening, life has its own karmic substance and the fetus has the karma of the parents. So it has made its choice, it is… ninety percent of the time it is correct or more, it is correct. Sometimes it is conscious that it could make a wrong choice. So this is the reason why during pregnancy, so many precautions were taken to create a different kind of atmosphere around a, a woman who is pregnant. We are giving that up now, a woman goes to work, she sits in the cinema, she goes all over the place. Such a thing is not maintained anymore. This was done just hoping something better than who both of you are comes into your womb. You know what I'm saying? You are husband and wife, you are of a certain quality. You want your child to be of a higher quality than who you are, not just like you.
Someone better than you should come into your room so that for that sake, even a husband was not allowed to see a woman beyond a certain stage of pregnancy because she is to be kept in a certain state of comfort and well-being with a certain type of thought, with a certain type of atmosphere, trying to please her system in all ways, right kind of incense, right kind of sounds, right kind of mantras, right kind of food, everything so that her body is in a state that it welcomes the right kind of being. Maybe in today's world it is <laughs> all these things are out of question. So if a being enters into this particular fetus and finds it unsuitable as it evolves to become a baby, then it leaves. That is why one door is kept open. So this is the Brahma Rantra. So what I say, is not intended to hurt you, it's a little technical. I want you to look at it that way because I can sit here and speak a few words of solace but that will not be a solution for you. You'll only feel good for today and tomorrow morning it'll be the same again. I want you to listen to this carefully. If any of our children die, before they're four years of age, you will see people will work themselves into pain. Actually, there is no pain. When they say there's no pain, there is emotional pain, there is no wrenching things happening within you, people think this is because it's only a few years. That's not true. You can get attached in a day. It doesn't take four years. This is simply because that life is not full-fledged yet. Even the governments in the world consider, if you, if you have to take the IMR rate, infant, infant mortality rate, you take below four years because it has been a common thing till recently now that the medical interference is little too much, otherwise a lot of children would die before they're four years of age without any ailment, lot of them, simply like that because life is unestablished, not fully established. When it's an infant, when your child is an infant, that is when your contact with the child is big time. By the time he is four, he or she is four, they start running around, they're not with you. You can't hold them, they want to be all over the place, they want to see the world. But before four years of age, they're so much with you, in spite of that, physically being connected to them is not so strong because they are not physically connected to their own body very strongly. So the same has not happened within you very strongly. This is something that most people will say, no, 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 when my child was three months, I was so attached. I know those things. That's why I said this is a little bit technical. Only if you're willing to observe life very carefully, you will know this. Emotionally, if you look at it, on the first day of the child being born, you were very much attached. Even before it's being born, you're attached, isn't it? Physiologically, your connection with the child increases in a dramatic way after the child crosses somewhere between forty to forty-eight months. At that time, your physiological connection with the child becomes much more immense and it is happening in your body. Something is happening in your body which most people don't decipher. They experience something happening with them before four years. After four years, child is a problem, where is it going, where is it, school admission, this one, that one, you know. Because of other engagements, they miss this experience, otherwise at that time something clicks in. Because that being and that body clicked in, in approximately forty to forty-eight months after its birth. When that clicks in, 
you come to a certain ease because it becomes a part of you, you don't have to consciously hold it. A natural holding is happening. If a child dies young, before four years, they will be disappointed, emotionally disturbed, but not grief-stricken. This is not because of duration at all. This is because still that being has not connected with that body. And you must understand, you are only a provider of the body. You cannot create a being. It is not in human hands to create a being. You only provide it a body, you facilitate a body. So only when that being really clicks on to the body that you provided, something clicks on within you and occupies a certain space. It occupies a certain space within your own system. If we just check somebody's energy, we know whether they have had children or not. You go to a local astrologer, for twenty-five rupees, he will tell you how many children you have, whether they're surviving or not surviving, even what their names are. For twenty-five rupees, I'm telling you, that's half a dollar. They'll give you a brief synopsis of your children, their characteristics, their names, everything. Because it occupies a certain space within you, and if you're willing to observe, it is very much there. Now, this connection, this physiological connection is very strong till the child becomes twenty-one. After twenty-one, it starts dissipating once again. This is a beautiful natural system of caring for the offspring, bringing it up and also being capable of releasing it when you have to. If somebody comes to me and says, bless my children, I'll ask, how old are they? If they're below twenty-one, we really bless them. If they're over, we banter with them, joke with them and send them because it's no use. It's no use blessing you for your children if they're over twenty-one years of age. We will have to bless them, they're individuals by themselves. If they're below twenty-one years, you can bless a mother or a father and have a deep impact on the child. But if they're over twenty-one, you… they have to come by themselves. Blessing the mother, blessing the father is of no consequence or great significance. It's only emotional significance. This should not happen to anybody, but it happens. Nobody should die before their children die. It's always best we die before our children die. That's how it should be, the natural order of life. Sometimes it does happen. It is happening to somebody or the other every day. Most people believe it will never happen to them. It's not so. It can happen to anybody. Now that it's happened to us, it is best. Before it happened, we could have done anything to save that life. Once it's happened, it's time to look. It's time to look deeper within yourself and understand what this whole process is. How profound it is, at the same time, how binding it is and how liberating it can be. In India, people desperately want to have a son. The reason why they want to have a son is, today the social situations have changed, the technological and travel capabilities of people have changed, otherwise, when they come of age, the girl gets married and goes to somebody else's house. If you die, she may not be able to come because she has to walk. She need not be in America. If she's in Salem, 
she won't come walking two hundred kilometers. By the time she comes, your cremation will be over. So we want a son because the son lives here. In today's world, it's irrelevant. But I want you to understand a thousand years ago, this was very relevant. If she was living fifty kilometers away, she wouldn't come in time. She has her own children, her own husband, her own family. She can't just drop and walk away. And alone she can't walk away. Everything would be forested and somebody has to escort her down, so it wouldn't happen. That's why the twelfth day was arranged for the daughters to come. When you die, you want your child around you. They said son, because practically it was only possible for the son to be around, daughter would be somewhere else. The reason why a child should be around is, there are methods to make use of that little pocket within you, a little empty space within you, which is occupied by that being whom you refer to as my child. And if he does the right things, he can liberate you. It's for this, those people who live completely unaware and they don't do anything about themselves, they're depending upon their children to liberate them. And that became a whole tradition by itself. Varanasi is known for this. People come either with their aged parents who want to die in Kashi or they have just died with the ashes and whatever else they come because they somewhere understand they could liberate them. But today, there are very few people who know how to do these things properly. So it is… it has become a mere ritual. So what I am trying to tell you is, once you bear a child, a certain space of who you are is occupied by that, by that being whom you refer to as your child, because you only provided a body for this being. Because generally people's interaction with each other is only either physical or mental or emotional and it never goes beyond that. We believe that's everything about that person. But when a person dies or when a person sheds his or her body, all that is gone. The mental structure is gone, emotions are gone, body is for sure gone. So everything that you knew as mine is gone. And that being that you have always held as your child, is as much a stranger to you as just about anybody. Now, at the same time, after someone is dead, if they happen to be our parents, we do certain things. If they happen to be our children, we do nothing. Because you have a little space occupied by the quality of that being. But they don't have that little space occupied within… by you. You cannot occupy the future generation. The future generation occupies a little space in the past, but the past generation will not occupy and cannot occupy in the very nature of things, in the future generation. Because of this, as a child grows and becomes close to twenty-one, you look at them, they look like absolute strangers. You can't believe, did you bear them? Are they your children? Is this the same little baby that I brought up? Can't recognize what they're doing because you do not have an abode in them, but they have an abode in you. So if you want to influence your children, don't try to do too many things with them. You must be able to identify where this space is. If you keep it in a certain way, things will happen okay. This is a remote control that a parent has about the child. So if you want to influence your child, within the first eleven days that you have come, Kala Bhairava Karma does 
definitely does something significant. Apart from that, if you want to do anything, your thoughts, your emotions and your actions have no influence over your child who is no more. But if you turn inward, if your way of being becomes pleasant, it has a tremendous influence. Because that little space, if it becomes pleasant, that being will experience pleasantness. Till that being finds another body, till then you can influence. Once it finds another body, you have nothing to do with it. Now somebody else claims this is my child and a whole new drama begins again. This is not a right thing to tell someone who's lost their child just a week ago, I'm sorry. But that's how it is. So, one thing, one thing that all of us need to understand is Children only come through us, they don't come from us. It's a privilege that somebody chose to come through you, that you could be a passage for another life. We don't own it, we can't claim rights over it. It just come, came through us, it's a great privilege. You must cherish that privilege. And your daughter, from the moment she was born to you and for some unfortunate reason whatever has happened, till then in so many ways, in so many, many ways, which one may not realize at that time, but now if you look back, in so many, many, many ways she enriched your life, isn't it? You just have to cherish that and make the… if you want to influence her, you make this as pleasant as possible. That's the only way you can influence her. You cannot… if… if she was your mother, you could influence her in other ways by doing karmas, kriyas and things. But with your child you cannot do that. The only way you can make it pleasant for that being is to making this being absolutely pleasant because that little space that being occupied, that quality and that dimension is still connected till it finds another body. Once it finds another body, then it's gone. And even when you leave one day, you can leave whichever way, but if you leave through the Brahmarandra, it is the best way to leave. If you leave consciously whichever part of the body, it is fine. But if you can leave from there, it is the best way to leave. So because there is lot of talk about this, there are books which have been written about it, one thing is there's a huge possibility that one and in individual people may start imagining things on top of their head or between their forehead, they keep imagining many things. Because you need to understand this, <coughs> wherever you focus your mind, there, there will be some twitching. If you want, right now you experiment, hold your little finger like this and focus at the tip of this little finger, you will see within a minute's time there will be twitching. Any part of the body, if you focus your mind, some twitching you will notice. So that is not to be mistaken as some other great process happening within you. Or of course there are physiological twitches and twists happening here and there, once in a way it happens to you, you are sleeping some part of the body, little bit of twitch and this and that, especially if you are very nervous, it could happen to you quite often. If you are at ease, it may not happen. If you are in a little bit of tension or stress, it could happen to you in different parts. So that is not to be mistaken either. I don't know if I should say this because if I say this, you may start imagining all kinds of things. If you become meditative, now that you are becoming, as you do Shambhavi, I shouldn't say this, it'll lead to all kinds of things. Because people have a very wild imagination. I always avoid telling them anything which is not in their experience because they will start imagining all kinds of things. Anyway, if you 
don't do this to yourself, it's not necessary. If I hold my hand above my Brahmarandra, even up to four feet above, if you hold it, you will see a clear feeling in your hand, which is always in the form of like a… something like an eight. This will be always happening if you keep your energies in a certain way. This can happen to every human being, but it is happening within. It doesn't extend itself beyond because the final two chakras out of the 114 chakras that are there in the system, two chakras are outside the body. If dimensions beyond the physical become a constantly, constantly active process, some of you might have felt this in your Shambhavi, for a few moments you feel something beyond yourself has become active. So if a dimension beyond your physicality becomes a continuously active process within you, then after some time, these two chakras which are dormant and outside the body become active. If they become active, there is a… you got an antenna on your head. You seen a police antenna? You got an antenna on your head, which is… which is giving you a certain perspective of life. Experiences beyond the body often associated with near-death experiences out-of-body experiences or other spiritual encounters are fascinating phenomena reported by individuals across cultures and periods. Here are few notable cases and types of experiences. Remote viewing refers to the purported ability to perceive distant or hidden targets using extrasensory perception or mind-to-mind -mind communication. Some individuals claim to have developed the capacity to project their consciousness to remote locations and describe what they see or sense there. The US government's target project conducted during the Cold War investigated the potential military applications of remote viewing. Although the project was eventually discontinued, it generated significant interest in the phenomenon and spurred further research into its feasibility. Shared Death Experiences SDEs, occur when individuals who are present at the deathbed of a loved one report shared or simultaneous mystical or spiritual experiences. These can include seeing a bright light feeling a sense of peace or witnessing the departure of the dying person's soul or consciousness. SDEs challenge conventional notions of individual consciousness and suggest the possibility of interconnectedness or shared spiritual experiences during significant life events. Near-death-like experiences NDLEs. Some individuals report experiences similar to NDEs or OBEs without being in a life-threatening situation. These near-death-like experiences occur spontaneously or during periods of extreme stress, trauma or meditation. While NDLEs share common features with NDEs, they raise questions about the relationship between physiological factors and the subjective experience of altered states of consciousness. Cultural Variations Experiences beyond the body can vary widely across different cultural and religious contexts. For example, in Hinduism, practitioners may seek to attain states of samadhi or transcendence through yoga and meditation, leading to experiences of union with the divine. Indigenous cultures often have their own traditions of journeying beyond the body, such as shamanic practices involving spirit travel, soul retrieval or communication with ancestral spirits. Scientific Challenges and Implications Investigating experiences beyond the body presents numerous methodological challenges for scientists including the subjective nature of the phenomena, the difficulty of replication and the potential influence of cultural and personal beliefs. Despite these challenges, ongoing research in fields such as neuroscience, psychology and parapsychology seeks to elucidate the underlying mechanisms and implications of these experiences for our understanding of consciousness and reality. Integration and Application Many individuals who have led experiences beyond the body seek to integrate these insights into their daily lives and spiritual practices. This may involve cultivating mindfulness, compassion and a deeper appreciation for the interconnectedness of all beings. Some spiritual traditions offer teachings and practices aimed to facilitating experiences of expanded consciousness and spiritual awakening with the goal of promoting personal growth, healing and the realization of one's true nature. By exploring these additional dimensions and nuances, we gain a more comprehensive understanding of the diverse range of experiences beyond the body and their implications for our understanding of consciousness, spirituality and the nature of reality.